uh, why are we using this term uh, rediscovery uh, i would like to spend a minute on this because uh, fundamentally architecture is about built spaces and uh, how we articulate light and ventilation within the built spaces is very integral light and ventilation is very integral to the way in which we build but uh, somehow over a period of time what has happened is that with the advent of uh, modern day technology uh, there are many new equipments which have uh, got created and on account of that we've been creating artificial environments i never thought uh, that architectural architects will be working on this subject which is very important and perhaps uh, uh, never before architects may have thought of considering this type of program of uh, having a look at what are the environmental needs or environmental mandate in fact uh, environment though very very important in our ancient uh, indian studies did not receive much attention uh, till 1972 when stockholm conference took place for the first time <music> one and all thank you for joining uh, we welcome all the delegates welcome to this one and all welcome to this important webinar online webinar hosted by the school of planning and architecture new delhi on the topic built environment and public health the rediscovery of light and ventilation first i am going to talk about the school of planning and architecture new delhi School of Planning and Architecture New Delhi is a premier institute which consistently ranks in the top 5 NIRF rankings in architecture and planning. It is an institute of national importance created by an act of parliament. It was established in 1941 and this is currently under the Ministry of Education Government of India and we have major national and international architects and planners who are alumni of school and planning school of planning and architecture new delhi we also want to take this opportunity to thank isaac india's leading not for profit and cyber security built environment and professional ethics ngo for kindly providing us the webex platform for this webinar to start with i would request mm-hmm. our director dr p s n rao but before i request him to start i'd like to introduce dr p s n rao dr p s n rao is the director of school of planning and architecture new delhi which is hmm? equivalent to the post of okay. vice chancellor of a university he is we have to just have him as a person who is an architect engineer and town planner an a i i a f i t p and a f i e he is has over 34 plus years of experience He was the former chairperson of DUAC for six years and seven months, and he is currently also the professor of housing at School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. He has written in multiple uh, journals, multiple news outlets, and he is the voice of housing and important oh, matters, okay. especially with respect to smart cities and urban development in India. We welcome Dr. P. S. N. Rao. thank you uh, professor raja singh <clears throat> good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, i am very happy to uh, welcome all of you for this webinar being uh, conducted by the school of planning and architecture new delhi uh, uh, respected uh, honorable uh, 
Justice uh, Adarsh Kumar Goelji, Chairperson of the National Green Tribunal, uh, Professor Yugao Lee, Chair Professor from the Hong Kong uh, University, uh, Architect uh, Premender Raj Metaji, several other learned uh, speakers who have assembled here this afternoon, uh, fellow faculty members at SPA, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am very happy to welcome all of you to this very important and topical uh, subject of uh, built environment in public health, the rediscovery of light and ventilation. Uh, why are we using this term uh, rediscovery? Uh, I would like to spend a minute on this because uh, fundamentally architecture is about built spaces and uh, how we articulate light and ventilation within the built spaces is very integral. Light and ventilation is very integral to the way in which we build. But uh, somehow over a period of time, what has happened is that with the advent of uh, modern day technology, uh, there are many new equipments which have uh, got created. And on account of that, we've been creating artificial environments. If you go back uh, maybe a hundred years ago, you would find most of the buildings that were built at that point in time, uh, they, they hardly had any technological devices, uh, except uh, perhaps for a, for a bulb or a fan. So the interior environments uh, required to look at uh, natural light and natural uh, ventilation. And for that, uh, we uh, had the provisions made in the in the built form in such a manner that that uh, when we want light we would when we want light to come into the buildings then then uh, we would articulate our built form in such a manner uh, and when we want to have uh, shade then we would appropriately design our buildings in that kind of a manner so uh, therefore we had ventilators we had high roofs to keep the interior cool for the warm air to go out, we had ventilators. We had deep verandas uh, to keep the outer walls shaded. We also had internal courts or courtyards. So the built form was uh, designed in such a manner that uh, the natural light and ventilation was taken care of. Bring in just the amount of light that you need so that you can be comfortable inside. Uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, technology has advanced. Air conditioning came into the picture. We now have modern day air conditioners. And to cool large areas, large volumes uh, would become more expensive. So slowly, the building height started reducing. We started putting false ceilings and so on and so forth. The courtyards disappeared because land became more expensive. And we did away with uh, verandas because that would just be a waste of space uh, in our urban areas. Built space is very, very expensive, whether to purchase or to give it on rent. So for a wide variety of reasons, interior environments have started changing. And with that, the way we played with light and ventilation has also started changing. And, and uh, on account of that, we had to redo our building codes uh, and and whether it was a large public building, whether it was a meeting hall, whether it is a auditorium, we brought in this concept of an air change. So how many air changes per hour you would require, and so on and so forth. So uh, we we uh, inhale uh, oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide and and all of that. Uh, the science and the engineering and the technology of uh, light and ventilation is becoming more and more important because uh, there is something called the sick building syndrome and and people inside buildings feel uncomfortable there is spread of disease so today uh, we are now looking at a multidisciplinary environment we are looking at public health we are looking at um, uh, virology we are we are looking at um, 
technology, we are looking at science. Uh, and, and, we, and we are trying to uh, see how all of these can be seen together so that we create interior environments uh, which are more healthy. There was a time when probably classes were held in the outside, in the open. There was also a time when uh, we would keep all our doors and windows open and only probably the head of the institution uh, would, would be eligible for an air conditioner and all others would just keep their doors and windows open and let in plenty of fresh air and fresh light. And, and uh, that was how offices were working. That was how residences were working. But unfortunately, today, uh, you wake up in an air-conditioned environment. You get into a car or a metro train, which is also an air-conditioned environment. You come into your office, which is again an air-conditioned environment. So 24 by 7, you are in a closed built environment. And where, when you are in this closed built environment, the question of the quality of air inside this uh, is, is, uh, is, is put uh, to, to test. And that really affects our uh, health. So today we have uh, other gadgets uh, uh, like uh, air purifiers and so on, which have also come uh, supposedly to our rescue. But then, uh, what are we doing? We have moved from a point where every natural resources were available and we were all living with that quite comfortably. But we've closed ourselves in and now we are surrounding ourselves with a variety of gadgets and more and more of those as we go along. So, are we doing the right thing? I think that is where the question today arises. And particularly in the COVID-19 environment, uh, this this has come to a very sharp focus. So that is the reason why uh, more research has now started uh, in this particular area. And I think that's a good sign that we are we are we are going to now take a relook and rediscover light and ventilation in the built environment. I think it's a very very topical area. Uh, th th there's a lot for architects to uh, unlearn and relearn, and architects and biologists and virologists. Uh, all of us have to look at it together and of course the 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 right to a healthy environment the judiciary uh, the, the legal luminaries they they also have uh, a very important role to play in all of this so uh, i would like to thank uh, all the people who have been working day in and day out to put this uh, conference together i welcome all of you to this webinar on built environment and public health and and i am sure that the deliberations of this afternoon will will enlighten all of us, will help us take a relook at at the concepts that have been uh, agreed for so long. So we may have to actually now redo certain portions of our building bylaws. We may have to redo certain portions of our national building code. We may have to also redo uh, some portions of our teaching curriculum. The way we are we are shaping the future minds. The future architects of the of the days to come. So uh, I think a lot of takeaways are are going to be there. So I will not uh, stay uh, uh, for long between you and the excellent lineup of speakers, luminaries that we have uh, this morning with us. So thank you, uh, Professor Anil Diwan and uh, Professor Raja Singh. You put you put together a nice uh, set of speakers, and we are all eagerly waiting to listen to all of them and to learn from them so that we can we can. Uh, decide on the way forward. So, uh, a very warm welcome to all of you once again, and uh, uh, thank you. Over to Rajasan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Professor Dr. P. S. N. Rao. Uh, next, up, we have our most important, you know, chief guest for today. We have. Uh, Honorable Mr. Justice Adars Kumar Goyal. His Lordship is the chairperson of the National Green Tribunal since July 6, 2018. He was the former judge of Supreme Court, former Chief Justice of Odisha High Court, and former Chief Justice of Guwahati High Court. He was the acting Chief Justice and judge at the Punjab and Haryana High Court at Chandigarh. He has practiced for more than 27 years on the other side at, at the bar in Punjab and Haryana High Court, Delhi High Court, 
and Supreme Court. On a personal note, he's very close to the environment and he's often seen, uh, you know, in the morning in Lodi Gardens and he's very close to the environment. So we welcome uh, Justice Mr. Adarsh Kumar Goyal. Please, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Absolutely, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Rao, Director SPA. Uh, Dr. Lee Chair, Professor, Hong Kong University. Uh, architect Parminder Raj Mehta, Ex-President, Council of Architecture. Architect Dipendra Prashad. Our, my friend, uh, Shri Kesi Mittal, Ex-Bar Council of Delhi Chairman. Dr. Kapilya Var, Ms. Rithima Kohl. Ms. Mohan Basu, Dr. Anil Divan, architect Raja Singh, and uh, all the dignitaries and participants of uh, this program organized by the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, on the subject of built environment and public health, rediscovery of light and ventilation. I'm so happy to see such program being organized by uh, this prestigious institution of School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. I never thought uh, that architectures, architects will be working on this subject, which is very important. And perhaps uh, uh, never before architects may have thought of considering this type of program of uh, having a look at what are the environmental needs or environmental mandate. In fact, uh, environment, though very, very important in our ancient uh, Indian studies, did not receive much attention uh, till 1972 when Stockholm Conference took place for the first time uh, to consider what should be done in the wake of the threats of global warming, which threatened a large section of mankind. In 1972, the Indian Prime Minister of that time pointed out that there is a serious difference in approach in India and the rest of the world. In India, we don't use the words like exploiting the nature. Like she cited her own father, who was the earlier first prime minister, who, and she referred to the conquering of Himalaya and the then prime minister of India raising an objection, don't use the word conquering of Himalaya. You may have climbed Himalaya, but you can't say you have conquered Himalaya. Then we are saying exploiting the nature for the benefit. Nature can't, should not be accepted because our thinking is that we are not superior to the nature. We are not the master of the nature. We say in our prayer every day in the morning that Mother Earth is the mother and the man is the son. So man survives or man is sustained or human activities are sustained by nature, by the environment. Uh, Guru Nanak Dev said, Pavan Guru Pani Pita, means he compared air to Guru, teacher, and water to father, and earth to mother. So that has been ancient thinking. Our Prime Minister cited thousands of year old uh, studies in Atharva Ved to explain the development of sustainable development and relationship of man and environment, where she cited a shlok, which means that you should, you should take from the nature only that much which you can give back, so that the next generations are not affected. So these principles of intergenerational equity, 
precautionary principle, sustainable development principle, which have now become embodied uh, concepts of environment law, were very much there in our Indian philosophy. We are getting the light from the sun. We are now discussing rediscovery of light and ventilation. So we are getting the light from the sun. We are getting light from the ventilation, from the air. Can there be a substitute? Can it be manufactured in a factory? And can there be a substitute to the sunlight or to the ventilation which nature provides? We have dark nights, bright days in certain parts of the world. And the government gives subsidies to people to come and live there for providing essential services or needs of the people who are born there. There, there will be night for months together because there will be no sun, sunlight. Or there will be day for months together, there will be no night. We have so many planets in our solar system and we are still trying to discover is there a life outside the earth? So far we have not been able to find any life outside the earth. Reason is the balance required or environment required. It is the discovery of water first, which uh, was found to be essential component for survival. And all the civilizations in the world grew on the banks of the rivers or where the water was available because water without water Air was of course available, but water was not available everywhere. Therefore, the civilizations commenced wherever water was available. So, it is the, the slogan our Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri gave was Jai Kishan and Jai Jawan. Because you need for security, you need army or soldiers. And for food security or for survival, you need the farmer. And later, another slogan was added to it, that is Jai Vigyan, the science, the studies. Without science, perhaps our life can't be meaningful. But the science is a weapon which can be used as well as misused. It can be a weapon of destruction, it can be a we weapon of great happiness. The, according to our Indian systems, mission of life is adding to the happiness are we making value addition to other people on the earth that is our prayer that to make everyone happy sarve bhavantu sukhina that is our mission and every activity it may also be activity of the school of planning and architecture is meant to be an activity which makes value addition to the happiness of the mankind so you are undertaking a scientific study of what value addition you can make by your knowledge of architecture and planning. That's how you are having a discussion on the subject. Uh, you have a, a professor from Hong Kong University about awareness on, awareness on airborne infections spread across the world, which is, a, which is killing millions of people. Airborne diseases are killing millions of people. Perhaps we are not fully conscious and much more consciousness is required. And I'm sure uh, this address by Professor Lee will help us on this subject. And then you have the subject of bylaws and public health from uh, uh, architect Mehta. There was a recent Supreme Court judgment directing demolition of the uh, towers in a residential complex. The reason is that the distance between the two towers was required to be at least equal to half of the height of one tower. There were some other issues also, but then it was found that if you do it, anyway, some architect must have advised or ill-advised uh, construction of such towers. So the role of architects is so important 
the i was thinking that we are only going by the building bylaws which are prepared by experts and architects just follow the laid down rules if they are sincere to the job but now i find from discussion which you are going to have that you are not merely going by the laid down rules but you are going much far being conscious of the air pollution or air quality to be breathed there are most of the architects will be thinking of maximizing the uh, utilization of the area having maximum covered area by which the person who is making the colony or making the building can have maximum commercial advantage but then sustainable building concept i find from your subject that means you are also thinking that not merely what is the commercial value of the building but what is the environmental value of the building you are also thinking of green building you are thinking of sustainable building that means you want to ensure the quality of life not of the person who will ultimately occupy not only the person who is developing a project not only from his point of view but also from the point of view of the person who is going to take uh, and occupy the building will he get, get natural light unfortunately in many places we go the buildings are recklessly air conditions are installed and recklessly air conditions are made to function perhaps the earlier buildings i have visited some buildings built thousand of years ago or 500 years ago and the architects of that time who were not so well read as you are they designed the building in such a way that no air conditioner is needed naturally air conditioned and the natural light is coming we did not have any light or uh, as a student up to 8th class i studied in the earthen land in a village there was no light light came much later now the light has not only become a source of uh, comfort but also a nuisance to some extent too much of lighting everywhere and you say all right switch off the light because uh, it is affecting the neurology it is affecting the physiology of the body and uh, these are some of the issues which need serious consideration you have also added against my name the role of judiciary yes role of judiciary is very much there we always wish there is no judiciary why judiciary is needed at all judiciary is needed if a dispute arises why a dispute should arise but that may be an ideal situation where no dispute is arising but we are not in the ideal state of affairs so disputes are arising on everything everything is brought to the court because we are not able to resolve or one or the other party is lacking in the righteous conduct or sincerity which makes compels the agreed party to come to the court or sometimes the agreed party may dragging the other person to court unnecessarily so that's how one or the other party is certainly not on the righteous path then what happens it may be a dispute between citizen and citizen it may be a dispute between citizen and state also under our modern constitution the state has several obligations and there are now as they call political compulsions etc which uh, drive the state to take certain decisions but then those decisions are to be tested on the touchstone of the constitution by the judiciary is the decision consistent with the fundamental rights is it within the scope of your power is the decision taken honestly is it bona fide have you considered relevant considerations so these are the issues which judiciary has to take a call in exercise of there is a writ power with the higher courts or constitutional courts as we call them high court high courts in india supreme court in india which can enforce all statutory rights as well as constitutional rights there are civil courts which enforce civil rights which are granted under different laws there are various forum you can go to the high court you can go to the supreme court apart from that like i am now in green tribunal so green tribunal has a mandate 
to ensure that if there is a violation of environmental norms, so whatever is required to be done for protection of environment, you can give a positive order or you can require the violator to pay compensation or you can issue an order to stop an activity which is not compatible with the environment, which violates the laid down laws. At times it is happening, the laws are there, but enforcement is not. That also becomes a matter of matter being brought before the judiciary and the judiciary can make the person who is not enforcing accountable. All right, this is your statutory duty, your constitutional duty. Why are you not doing it? And if you are not doing, do it. And if you don't do, there may be consequences. So there is a role of judiciary, but that's not the only role. The role which uh, uh, this uh, school of planning and architecture is playing is unique and significant and important in its own way. Uh, it supplements the role of advancing environmental justice or improving the quality of life. So in uh, Supreme Court judgments, I'm not referring to the judgments. I'm not uh, uh, in a limited time uh, going to take, open up more issues. But then by Supreme Court judgments, it has been made compulsory to teach environment as a subject to school students. There are voluntary organizations. There are large number of movements started without any law, without any court order, voluntarily by people because environment requires a healthy life and which is an inherent right, which is a human right to breathe fresh air, to drink fresh water, but today, Everybody on the table has a water bottle. Why? Because the water sources of water are not clean or pollution free or of the requisite quality, which is not harmful. The water which you find everywhere, you can't trust it. Therefore, you go and buy a bottle of water. And if you buy a bottle of water, you generate plastic, which further adds to the pollution. We perhaps do not know. We use the water bottle and throw it, but where, where is the destination? Where is it going? Is it creating further toxicity in the environment on account of unsafe disposal? So much of waste is generated. We have huge mountains of waste, garbage. We don't know where to take them because it requires serious effort and the government machinery has its own limitations. So it is the school of planning and architecture or other educational institutions, other voluntary bodies, a common man, the problems faced are so serious unless there is a collective effort made and participation is of everyone individually as well as collectively, the problems cannot be changed. With that, I will not take your more time. And I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. If I can answer any questions, if there is a time available, I'll be happy to do that because out of allotted time, I have perhaps 10 more minutes up to 2.40. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, uh, Lord Chief, for, uh, you know, enlightening us all about, you know, this important topic. And, you know, uh, now I request everybody who's listening, if there's any question that you would like to ask. Any questions from anybody? Mm -hmm. Any student who's uh, logged in, any question that you want to ask, you can uh, please raise your hand or start speaking or type in the message box. Okay. So, sir, I would like to ask you a question, sir. Uh, sir, in 1914, the post of the sanitary commissioner was merged with the post of DG of Indian Medical Services, which according to uh, K. Sujata Rao, former secretary of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, reduced the importance of public health. So what can we do as uh, organizations, as, uh, uh, you know, public spirited citizens to make sure that this public health again becomes important, sir? 
I will first of all thank you for that question, which is of great importance. The question relates to some administrative structural change, which is a policy matter generally left to the government, but anything can be tested in the on the anvil of the public interest. Does it advance public interest? What is the compulsion? It can be an issue raised and uh, don't underestimate power of any citizen or any 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 institution if uh, it has happened and uh, as you have pointed out that some officer of the government itself pointed out it is not proper you can take up the issue in various ways you can raise that issue with the concerned authorities themselves if it becomes necessary, you can also bring in the court in the name of public interest. If it advances public interest, court can also ask them to make a change. Maybe at a given point of time, it was thought unnecessary. Public health officers are not necessary. There was no awareness and perhaps environment was not, condition was not so bad. It's due to urbanization, due to modernization, due to industrialization. Uh, environmental problems have increased and with the increased problem, you have to have a relook at all, all the decisions which have been taken earlier. So it's an important issue. I think you can raise it uh, either at a judicial forum or first at the administrative forum if it becomes necessary, also at a judicial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm sure all of us, you know, gained a lot from sir's very important uh, address, you know, the keynote address. And he covered a lot of points with respect to judiciary and our everyday lives and how right to healthy environment is an essential component of our everyday lives, especially when we are in cities like New Delhi and other metropolitans in India. I would like to again, you know, on the behalf of School of Planning and Architecture and on the behalf of my director, sir, who's present here. Thank you, sir, for coming today and taking time out and addressing this audience and, you know, sharing your most valuable thoughts with us, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we would now go on, and our next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Hugo Lee. <clears throat> professor Dr. Hugo Lee, I would introduce Professor Dr. Hugo Lee. He's the Chair Professor of Building Environment and the Honorary Professor of School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. Sir is the present, you know, member part of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. He's the editor of Indoor Air, which is a very renowned global journal on the topic of indoor air quality. He was the member of the WHO appointed COVID-19 IPC Guidance Development Group. He's also in 2003, when there was a outbreak of SARS in Hong Kong, he helped the government of Hong Kong in investigating you know the spread of SARS 2003 in Amoy Gardens, which became a very landmark case in this matter. He also, you know, works in the area primarily of mechanisms of transmission of, of transmission of airborne transmission of diseases. His work and his team's work has led to definitions of important components like short rate aerosol transmission, surface touch, and city ventilation, etc. So we are really, really honored. You know, sir took time out and out of his, you know, very important places that he addresses, he took time to address our humble gathering. We are really, really thankful to Professor Dr. Yugoli. Sir, are you are you there, sir? Can yeah, you? thank you, uh, Professor Devon and Professor Wong. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, really exciting to hear uh, the insightful speech by the Honorable uh, Justice, and so happy to see how India is preparing to face the new challenge, as we have discovered, the pandemic. So, I was asked to uh, talk about uh, how we get on to understand the importance of airborne transmission or airborne protection of SARS-CoV-2 uh, worldwide. As we all know, uh, um, last summer, August, I had a, a talk in one of the Indian conference uh, online 
and that time we were uncertain yet. There was a little recognition by the WHO and leading health organizations on airborne transmission, but now the story is different. Since uh, late April 2021, it's well recognized the importance of airborne transmission, in particular, short-range airborne transmission. So I uh, first, can you see my slide well? Uh, and yes, yes, sir, yes, yes, yeah. yes, so I thank all those people who has helped me and including friends in India and uh, for the encouragement. Um, before April this year, before WHO and the US CDC uh, recognized the importance of inhalation and or airborne, and there were two important uh, influential common commentaries. One is uh, in the British Medical Journal, one is in Science, and this is written by people like us who work with bioaerosols and ventilation. And they simply said, the improve, improving not indoor ventilation, the air quality will help us all to stay safe with regarding to the pandemic. And the building ventilation system must get much better. And this is the simple statement from the two commentaries. Um, for ventilation to work, it's actually a simple idea. So if you have indoor pollutants like exhaled uh, infectious aerosols, and then if the ventilation is very large, and you would have the same concentration as outdoors, outdoors is very low, so that will help. However, when we have the enclosures, actually it's very difficult to achieve the amount of ventilation. And the idea is how much ventilation do we need in order to minimize a certain indoor air quality risk, in this case, infection risk. And for infection, traditionally, by the time I talked to Indian friends last July or August, we were aware of the short range and the long range transmission in the long range, we have the possible aerosol transmission and or the aerosol uh, or the touch by formite. Formite is a very terrible word. Not many people know what it meant. And in close range, and we have the possibility of large droplets, short range airborne, and immediate surface touch or immediate surfaces. And we know then, we knew then it, the for the large droplets, it's really large ones, larger than 50 microns, not the five or 10 microns in the literature. And later on, we learned those three, this little few concepts actually quite confusing. And there was a time early, late last year, and I like to propose a three basic, possibly easier to understand the concept. And that was called, actually it's the inhalation of aerosols proposed originally by Professor Lin Seymour of Virginia Tech. And it's just by inhalation. If that's in the inhale, that's our traditional airborne. And it can be short range and the long range. In short range, you inhale slightly larger droplets. The deposition in the lungs, then the different locations possibly different. Then you have the drop deposition, or simply this large droplets, this spray, the deposit on the exterior surfaces of your uh, membranes, and then touching, and surface touch, very simple. You avoid touching uh, and keep a distance away. And these concepts, very simple ones, were later on also recognized by CDC. They also use a similar concept. Instead of airborne, formite, large droplets, we probably call inhalation, deposition, or spray and, and touch. So I think uh, uh, the chairman mentioned about the AMOE garden, and that's the first time as an engineer I was involved, and I'm glad to see many engineering studies followed. And now you cannot even read all the papers. And we try to understand the mechanism behind the inhalation, the spray and deposition, touch, and again, human behaviors becomes important when we touch, when we are in close contact with others. The question for SARS-CoV-2, 
all for influenza viruses is how much contribution from each of the sub transmission rules that we talk about. And traditionally, people like to have some kind of definite statistical analysis. And yes, this one works and this one does not work. But we also have outbreak analysis. And perhaps if we have cause effect analysis from the infection data, we can do animal modeling. And I think argument I have here, we can also deduct, uh, deduce that from basic physics and, and the chemistry. And I already reported last year the two outbreaks. I would like to reiterate it again simply because this is one with the most data. And later on in the second paper, we have proposed second by second video data of that restaurant. So in this restaurant, the middle table against the wall infected two tables nearby who they did not know. And the middle table came from Wuhan, and the neighboring two tables are local Guangzhou families. And it was interesting that it only affected two, infected two tables. And we find we measured the ventilation rate very low. My student now, right now, they are in Hunan province. There was a boat transmission, and we, I was told earlier by phone the ventilation also very poor in that boat. Um, so the ventilation was only one liter per second per person and someone far away and got infected, it was difficult even that time to conclude elsewhere. Also, people were infected similarly by the long range airborne transmission. And the bus uh, outbreak, we are just in time to revise for a journal. And this particular person had two bus trips, one large one and one small ones. He infected, both, uh, infected people on both bus. And the ventilation was greater in the last, next last, uh, the smaller bus. And on this big one, it's 1.7 liter per second per person. And you know that we normally ventilate our offices at 10 liter, 8 to 10. So on the mini bus, it was 3 liter per second, uh, but they had a, a much lower attack rate. So it's interesting. A larger ventilation led to a lower attack rate. And again, it, it was a possible evidence for long range airborne. And this one, we did not have the full video. We only had a few clips of videos. That's already lucky. And modeling also showed it's not possible by other routes. Um, Guangzhou block, I forgot if I talk about this case. Uh, that was also the first one of the first studies we did. And in this building, oh, I should mention the bus and the restaurant. Normally, you have a trouble to believe because you always think people can meet each other somewhere uh, in the restaurant. But uh, actually, they didn't. Even I told everybody they didn't by video, uh, CCTV video is available. Um, still, people still have this question. Now we have a situation where the family in the flats 1502 were affected, no, uh, infected two families above, 2502, 2702. In this outbreak, earlier in Guangzhou, they also had videos in the lift, and they find the two family never met. And of course, we studied using trace gas, injected trace gas in room in the flats 1502, and you find how the tracers uh, led to other flats. And we see this is a possible aerosol transmission. But that time, uh, we actually had a, a, a wrong perception. We thought of fecal aerosols, and now we know uh, they are uh, actually different. That's a separate story. But anyway, this outbreak is very different because it's between different flats. Interestingly, similar outbreaks, more than 10 of them occurred in Hong Kong, in Guangzhou. It's interesting. We never observed them reported elsewhere. So basically, the red, the, the Red, the red is a box, every box is a flat. The red infected most flats above. And of course you want to know why. In all these outbreaks, they, if you are not on the same column, the infection attack rate almost zero. So this is interesting. They always happen most of the time above, sometimes below. Um, so we propose this is due to the chimney effects as in the Guangzhou block. And there are uh, sequencing data supporting this 
control. And as I mentioned, those are very important outbreak studies, but they are one of the thousands, if not millions of outbreaks. How can you be sure the other millions of outbreak also due to uh, 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 inhalation? And hence, I listed uh, four basic observations. Close contact transmitter appears to dominate. Everybody knows we do social distancing, and most infection occurs indoors. Outdoor infection reported, to me, I only aware of less than, uh, it's in single digit. And then outdoor transmission is much less common, and transmission the long distance only reported in some super spreading events, as I mentioned. So this is interesting. The fact that the risk low outdoors and only indoors had infection, it's difficult to explain if you believe in large droplets, if you believe in surface touch. So if it is by um, dilution, and we know that if you're in outdoors at a distance 75 centimeters from you, a common distance between people, then the uh, dilution can be, uh, uh, if I remember, yeah, 12 folds. So 1 over 12, 0 0.008 as compared to at the mouth. So if I give you an open 003, if I in a room, I have a good ventilation, 10 liter per second per person, this concentration is 0 0.088. However, if the ventilation is very poor, then I have little model uh, after we spoke last last summer, and then it's become 0.129. So poor ventilation led to even poorer short range transmission, and that's very very important. By from this, actually, it's four basic principles. Then we figure out this whole thing is perhaps short range inhalation dominates with a long range inhalation as its continuum. And normally it happens when the ventilation is poor. So this is very important hypothesis. It remains as a hypothesis, and I hope that more data will support. So I'm I really believe in this hypothesis, with it really makes sense in why it's due to short range inhalation, and most importantly, short range inhalation affects ventilation. Because time, I will not get into this little mathematics, and and basically shows that if ventilation, what I have just described is interesting. I also find a little, you know, at a calm and rest conditions, ventilation 10 liter per second per person will be sufficient. I can also derive those formulas and figure out that probably more than five. I mean, okay, if you accept that risk, but lower than five is certainly not okay. And the, in the Hunan restaurant, uh, the bus three liter per second per person. I don't use air change for hours. Um, and so this is crucial. If you know normally 10 liter per second per person is okay, we buy that idea. So what happens in different indoor environments? So I adopted in a simple sense a equal exposure. And the exposure is very simple. My inhalation rate multiplied by concentration, multiplied by time. I assume two references, one, the room and the reference room. Reference room is still 10 liter per second per person. And by doing that, you can find in the new room, the ventilation rate that you need to have is simply 10 liter per second per person multiplied by two ratios, very important concept. One is the source, how much, uh, um, uh, aerosols you exhale, and then the, your inhalation rate. So as your activity increases, you inhale more, and you also exhale more. I mean, one simple assumption would be the number of droplets increase proportionally as your activity level increases. And if you saw, then both of them will increase, and I call that double multiply. And this double multiplier simply means that if I have 10 ventilation in the office environment, 10 liter per single person, I exhale quietly, and the other person also inhales quietly. But if in the gym, I exhale violently five times more, 
and another person inhales five times more. The ventilation requirement double ratio, five by five, 25. So if 10 there, now you need 250. No one can provide a 250 liter per second person in those environments. And we were not designed for that. We designed for normal ventilation requirement, probably five times. So now for respiratory infection, actually you need much more. And this explains why in those environments, karaoke, gyms, dancing floors, people have a higher risk of infection because we design for normal ventilation. And sometimes we don't even provide normal ventilation. And when you do that, you have you yeah, high activity level and you produce more droplets, droplets you inhale more. And this is this using this principle. I provide ventilation rate for all type of buildings. And then you find out for normal ones, the ventilation rate probably some of them are low, some of them are okay. And this explains why the infection risk is low in on airplanes. And because they have effective eight liter per second per person. Ventilation rate for filtration, another four. But in those James Health Clubs, you find they only provide the current standard maximum 20 data per second per person, but we need 200. So that's a differential. And that's why during the uh, infectious period, it's better to close down those business. I know many people like to do gym, and I encourage people to do outdoors. And outdoors are much uh, better environment, as long as the pollution is okay. And this is the same for other spaces for your restaurant. Restaurant, my calculation shows you need 50, 17 liter per second per person. So in Hong Kong, we are actually um, double the ventilation rate in all more than 20,000 restaurants in Hong Kong by law. Um, this is called dying catering promises. I think our uh, 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 honorable justice is here. So uh, this particular one, we have uh, uh, regulation, the laws that government can do something. So uh, in three few months time, all Hong Kong uh, restaurants improve their ventilation or adding HEPA or with UV. And that I think really helped. It took a lot big effort. I'm aware of only this effort in the world. And this also related to the, if people use carbon dioxide, normally you use probably 1000 PPM, but in a gym, you can only use 500. So gym is a very special environment and I will not go into details with this. So what we have learned in this pandemic and that those probably more than 5.5, 4.5 million people who died, I mean, obviously reported uh, 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 death, most of them should have in, been infected indoors and probably more or in poorly ventilated indoors. Thinking of this, I feel is very sad. And this is not indoor air quality problem. This is indoor air quality crisis. And it's perhaps more in uh, high activity indoors, uh, high activity indoor space, it may play a role. I must say that it is not really a ventilation problem. We call the light and the ventilation is very nice that you consider lighting, which I know less, but this is because ventilation remove gases, pollutants, also fine particles. However, this is about infectious aerosols. So the filtration, disinfection also play a role. You do not necessarily only increase ventilation. You can do that by better uh, filtration and disinfection. So there are two uh, different things. So I, this is where I think it's important to have this meeting. Normally, environment crisis leads to a revolutionary change to environment. As we have seen from sanitary revolution in the 19th century in Europe and later on in Asia, in India and China and elsewhere. And they have a, and then for the urban air revolution, we had a London for a crisis. I know now Indian also faced a crisis. In China, in pretty in Jinji area, the, uh, we had very serious PM 2.5 crisis. And that actually, a government adopted mandatory requirement. So the difference between mandatory requirement 
and the law enforcement is different from voluntary regulation we have now for building ventilation. This is where the law enforcement comes in, but it will have difficulties. And on the other hand, probably we, with more research, we know how to do it. Probably focus on high activity areas. And, you know, it's, uh, if you uh, thinking of this, actually this time we really learned both influenza and COVID-19 killed more people than even fire in many countries. And we do fire regulation, why not uh, ventilation regulation? However, this has uh, uh, issues. I think I must mention the issues are that with the carbon neutralization, the need climate change, and this will carry energy use uh, issues. And for people with a ventilation background, we also have, I did not cover non-uniformity and transient environment. I think I, I, I bypassed that, quickly go to the possible options. And we can make our central air conditioning system in urban environment more powerful, delivering more air, but that has an issue, as I mentioned, with energy requirement. You might install permanent, permanent individualized systems and uh, fan and filter units or fan disinfection units. But this again, it, it means resources, it means energy. And of course, we can make those portable individualized system available, install them when it's needed. Uh, and on the other hand, if we make masks available to everybody, that will reduce. I did not discuss if everybody reduce having wear a mask, the ventilation requirement will significantly reduce. If 50% filtration rate, 50, 0.5 by 0.5, 0.25, your requirement will be reduced by 75%. It's very, very significant. So the wear mask wearing is important. I think, of course, air purifier will work, but there's a lot of debate. Uh, in terms of some of the systems that are being sold in the uh, in the market, we use uh, HEPA filter, we use UVGI, uh, and, and and sorry, H HVAC systems, not HVSC. Um, anyway, I have no relationship with the manufacturer just showing them the possibility we can do. I think I uh, like to mention that uh, we now recognize, although still many people don't recognize, the short range inhalation predominates, and the ventilation for infection control, and that's our life, are different from the indoor air quality, normal indoor air quality, which is also our life. And we mentioned the right to health, healthy indoor air because it's double multiply, and. We know the poor ventilation versus short range inhalation risk. I probably like to see that it is the poor ventilation that has led to this pandemic. No transmission, no pandemic. If you think in that way, then the ventilation become important. However, as I mentioned, although this is indoor air quality, uh, air safety crisis, matter has to be considered in general other crises in the world. So we are not here to recommending that ventilation has to be provided, you know, all time in all buildings. I think, as I discussed earlier on, however, it's possible. In terms of uh, uh, mandatory regulation, I believe the law enforcement will be very difficult for such. So the new technology, technology, technologies in terms of monitoring and the better control system will be very useful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure about my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Hugo Lee. You know, we are really, really grateful to you that you took time today and you, uh, you know, shed light on this important matter. I would request uh, anybody who wants to uh, ask any question. Is there any question? Please, students, if there is any question, please ask. Any of the other delegates, if there's any question, please ask.
I so wanted to uh, ask a question. question. So, sir, I will ask you a question regarding uh, the bylaws, sir. Now, there has been a change in bylaws, and our next topic is also about bylaws with respect to the placement of buildings. You know how close buildings can be built. Do you think that has an effect on the ventilation overall? And do you think that is something that we should consider? Yeah, this is uh, uh, what I will for. Uh, uh, I have studied uh, city ventilation, ventilation of the city. Um, I think uh, India can probably learn from the mistakes that China has made in some part of the, our country. And for uh, Hong Kong, it's simply too crowded and introduce uh, some other issues. I mean, uh, urban heat island, uh, actually we call it urban cool island, it become cooler during daytime and, and also urban moisture. So we have a serious issue and the wind in part of Hong Kong actually becomes a uh, uh, luxury. Uh, even during typhoon season, you can go outdoors, no problem. Uh, the only thing you, you worry is something falling down. Um, so uh, um, the building density in a city is very important. I think you talk about the light also, and we have experts uh, in Hong Kong studying that. I, I believe that, uh, 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 of course, a, prop, a right density will be the best. And there is some studies, and we also published papers on, on that. And there is a optimum density and with respect, with respect to uh, solar radiation, heat gain into the building. And, but I must say that for respiratory infection, it, this is only one aspect, many aspects that need to be considered. Thank you. There are some questions in the chat. Do you want me to answer them? Yes, sir. There's a question in the chat from Hardeep Singh. He asked, how important is study on surface finishes and materials in reducing transmission of diseases? I think they are more important for enteric infection. And, and my colleagues, they publish a paper in science with a hypothesis that most of the respiratory infection probably more due to uh, inhalation, the importance of airborne. And we probably that's our new, uh, we need a lot of work to study that. However, we don't uh, um, uh, uh, rule out the possibility of involvement surfaces. I worry more about resuspension from the surface due to other activities. You shake your hand and then your clothes and the, the aerosol may be resuspended in the environment. By doing that, the surface finishes and materials also become important. Um, they are particularly important for enteric diarrhea. I mean, in your country, in, in this part of the world, Southeast Asia, very, very important. So I believe the surface uh, finishes and, and the materials and if they are very important hand washing. Um, uh, we have some papers on that. We, um, yeah, there's another question, uh, interesting question too. Biophilic design is a way forward and made uh, mandatory uh, spirals. I, this is too beyond me. And I think I only for, I feel that uh, if, if uh, any biophilic design can encourage ventilation, um, and we know the air, I think uh, uh, the Honorable Justice also mentioned healthy air. Um, water we have done reasonably well. I mean, not all in every part of the world, but uh, uh, this is about air supply. Air is not everywhere. In particular, good air is not everywhere. When they enclose the buildings, air is not there anymore. And that's the reason, but putting people there to live for 99% of the time, that's where we need you know, to do something. But we know the difficulties and challenges ahead. So I think uh, uh, this mandatory requirement uh, will need a liberal effort. Exactly how to do it, I am aware of different part. OECD had a discussion, Ashley had a discussion, Malaysia the other day had a meeting discussion. A lot of countries are discussing, but exactly how we do. But I do know without mandatory requirement, it's almost impossible to get us anywhere. There's one more question, sir. In the case of healthcare facilities, especially in critical units such as surgical and ICU areas, what ventilation rates would be preferred considering aerosol viral transmission and even in corridor areas? 
Yes, sir. Medical question, sir. Yeah, I think the uh, actually this is also we. Uh, it's uh, really depending whether my um, my uh, recommended ventilation rate uh, will one day be published and accepted. I think in those areas, uh, 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 as long as people are not in the uh, very high activity, then our current design can be used. Actually, our current design is fairly high for. Uh, Negative pressure isolation rooms, we recommend uh, probably is 12 air change per hour and translate into about 80 liter per second per person, depending on the size. And WHO has a standard for it. Um, um, for uh, corridors, we reduce, we have uh, less requirement. And uh, 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 however, if you in hospitals where you have uh, high activity areas, for doctors you may need higher. It depending who are the, you know, the sources. I think this ventilation rate requirement is not likely to be agreed upon quickly due to the lack of data. I only presented a interesting to me a idea because outdoor content risk is low, so we use that as a reference. And that's how I derive the indoor uh, requirement. On so that, yeah. on that, there's a question very relevant, sir. Uh, that uh, in India we are struggling with poor outdoor air quality. Most of the classrooms in school rely on natural ventilation. What is your take on opening of schools in India and COVID scenario? This is just related think, to what you just said. I think uh, uh, this is now. I already differentiate the re ventilation requirement for general indoor air quality and. Uh, you know, inhalation particles and, and PM 2.5. So it's all about risk uh, comparison. I mean, if they, if this disease is really something people are uh, scared of and then open the windows. If you think the outdoor, uh, you know, PM 2.5 is too high, then it's a different story, I think. And this can be determined by identifying if any potential infected persons in the room. Um, unfortunately, this we are getting into a, we have to make a choice and this choice is very difficult for teachers and students. I still believe opening windows is a good idea because it, it's, uh, uh, actually help people. Uh, however, if outdoor pollution is, is, uh, cannot be controlled. And, and then I think there's a serious issue for the government. We have to do it better. I believe that if outdoor uh, pollution cannot be resolved. We cannot resolve indoor, indoor uh, uh, pollution. Right, sir. Right. Thank you so much, sir. It's always a choice. You know, it's between the two evils. We have to choose one. Uh, thank tough. you so much. Uh, and you know, we are so honored to have uh, Professor Dr. Hugo Lee. There are some more questions which I will ask you through email because we are running short of time. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for coming. And I hope all the people from the Law enforcement also took note of this, and I hope we have mandatory laws in India about ventilation and the prevention of spread of airborne uh, diseases. Thank you so much, sir. I look forward to the day. I'm sorry I will I will leave, but enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you. So now we, I would like to introduce the next speaker and his topic. The next speaker is architect Premendra Raj Mehta, who's a practicing architect, has a multi-decade practice, and you know, it's an example is he's done the cannot face redevelopment project under the Jawaharlal Nehru Urban Renewal Mission. He is the ex-president of the Council of Architecture and was the member of the Central Business uh, Building Research Institute, CBRI Roorkee, for more than six times. He is the chairman of All India. Board of Architecture, Town Planning and Applied Art Education of AICT. He's represented India at WTO Geneva. He's a member of Technology Submission of Mission Housing for All. He's also the chairman of NABET, which is a body under the Quality Council of India. And you know, we're really, really glad because Sir has a keen interest in uh, bylaws and his topic is bylaws and public health experiences from practice. Please, Sir, all yours, Sir. So please un unmute. Uh, 
Um, Professor Rao, Honorable Justice Goel, other speakers uh, for today's discussion. Let me first of all thank uh, Professor Rao, uh, Director of SPA, for being uh, kind enough to invite me on this seminar and share some of my thoughts. I will make a presentation uh, and uh, touch upon some of the issues uh, which uh, concern us in practice and which has led to uh, a kind of uh, scenario in urban uh, centers, uh, which requires uh, urgent attention. Uh, directly. Mm -hmm. Just give me a second. Share. Just one second, please. Yeah. Ah, Raja, is my screen there? Uh, not yet, sir. Yeah. So please share the whole of your screen. Sorry. Uh, so should you move over to the next speaker while you uh, do the technical thing? Yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe that's better. Is that okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for the small technical glitch, but because of time, uh, we would request the next speaker. I would uh, introduce the next speaker. Our next next speaker is architect Dipendra Prasad, who has two decades of practice in DPAP. He's a sustainable design architect. You know, he's trained people at UN Habitat, Terry, Bureau of Energy Efficiency, CSC, CPWD, HADCO, UNDP, and School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. He's the founder member of IntBau and works on appropriate building materials, water harvesting, and community-based planning for educational infrastructure development. He's also uh, 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 comes to, as a visiting faculty. And he has, his alumni is School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, and IIT Delhi. And he's also done his PGD in urban planning from IHS, the Netherlands. We welcome uh, the Pender sir to this very important uh, webinar, sir. So you're on mute, sir. I've unmuted, I've unmuted myself. Thank you, yes. Raja. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Rao, for the invitation. Uh, 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 thank you so much, uh, Justice Goel, for your comments um, and the other speakers. Uh, and I'll start my presentation. Um, is my slide uh, visible? So please make it full screen. Okay. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, so assuming I'm, uh, uh, you know, the slide is visible, I will start. Yes. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think this is where we are. Um, basically, uh, this is the world before the pandemic. Can we return here? So, I think, of course, we can and uh, we must. Um, and I think uh, we have to work hard to make sure that we do. Um, so, um, 
uh, as we were discussing and as Professor Rao also mentioned, uh, I think architecture and the creation of the built environment have always been about, um, I think, uh, primarily been about modulating uh, light and ventilation. Um, and it's not just about actually providing the light and the ventilation, you know, really, when you're talking about the built environment, you are providing it as well, but also protecting the people from it. You're protecting people from the sun sometimes, you're protecting people from uh, cold winds and or, or very hot winds. So it's both. It's 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 a uh, it's it's a uh, you know it, it's you you provide some you you know prevent some. Now, um, now we are sitting in the pandemic. Uh, hopefully not in, the, not in the middle of it, uh, but um, you know the pandemics reminded us. Of course, we always knew that I think failure on the aspect of providing adequate light and ventilation will cause serious serious problems. Very serious problems. Now. Um, we have been talking about uh, health uh, and you know the virus pandemic for the past two years. We've been having a number of uh, discussions and so on, but it is the buildings where we are actually spending most of our time. In fact, because of the lockdowns and all, we spend even more time uh, in the buildings. And it is really the buildings which are not being uh, uh, designed to prevent this infection. And as Professor Lee presented, uh, I think that's where uh, the major problems in a way are. Now, um, I think uh, um, uh, one approach, uh, you know, traditionally has been uh, the tradition, you know, uh, has been uh, on how to look at uh, providing more open buildings so that, you know, the indoors sort of also mirrors the outdoors. So this is, let's say, a school project. There were some questions about school buildings, and I'm, I'm a certain supporter of, uh, you know, opening the schools. I think the mental issues, are, you know, which the children are facing are more serious. And uh, 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 we have to deal with the, you know, the aspect. We have to open the windows, and we have to make sure these are there. So, um, so in this particular school project, let's say, and this is a modern building. This is not a very old building. Uh, we one was one is talking about the courtyards, uh, you know, which you'd have over there. Uh, you were, uh, uh, you know, also talking about. Uh, uh, sorry, the presentation went out. Yeah, its presentation is here again. Let me just, uh, yeah. So we were talking about, you know, the courtyards. We were talking about, uh, you know, the recessed windows. We were talking also about ventilators. So, you know, ventilators in the classroom. So they provide a more generic spread out light and so on. Now, this has been the traditional approach. Now, what do you do about, uh, uh, you know, the current building uh, syndrome where, where we're trying to go fully air conditioned, uh, very high tech buildings uh, and so on. So that's where um, I think. The current movement, um, the current very active movement on green buildings comes into the picture where um, we realize that I think uh, we have uh, gained some successes in uh, reducing the energy consumption and water consumption. You know, of course, these are individual buildings are not at a city scale. I think that's where some other issues like, you know, broader transportation, etc. still need to be uh, addressed. But uh, but I, I feel, and I think a lot of us share that uh, feeling that um, uh, broader building health issues have remained unattended. So we have the sick building syndrome, we have fungal growth within buildings, we have viral spreads, and it's not just COVID, you know, which we're talking about, but even the common cold uh, spreads, uh, you know, hugely uh, in a building which would have bad, venti bad ventilation. And of course, uh, uh, then we're talking about vitamin deficiencies. Uh, so many articles on that. It's a public health issue, fluctuating body rhythms, uh, you know, because um, all of our buildings um, are having inadequate light, you know, and what I, what I call as exposure to the solar dome. The solar dome is the sky around us. Um, if we can't see the sky, if we can't get light, indirect light, uh, even. Uh, from the sun, then uh, our body, uh, you know, doesn't respond to that. And there are various, uh, various aspects or various effects, ill effects, so as to say. So a large number of, uh, uh, you know, modern air conditioned buildings are now uh, going on the path of first. Hello. Hello. Of the Ministry of Environment and Forests in uh, Delhi, Central Delhi, uh, and Justice Goel is very much connected to it. 
Um, so um, uh, this is an example of a green building where together with the CPWD, we were also uh, consulting. And that's where, uh, you know, we have a large solar bank installed on the top. But besides being a solar, it's also a shade. Um, the walls are protected, insulated. Um, you know, the glass is insulated. So protecting the envelope all around uh, protects the building from a lot of heat gain, which reduces uh, in a big way, it's dependent on air conditioning. Uh, despite being a very modern building, a high-tech building, it allows for open windows. Uh, if you have a good day, good weather, um, good weather times, you can open your window. Um, a lot of us are overcooling. Uh, so we're bringing it down set points to 20 degrees, 22 degrees. But what is a healthy set point? A healthy set point provides a good interface between the outside and the inside. You're coming from the outside, you don't get a thermal shock. So the set point here is 26 degrees plus minus one. Um, um, treated fresh air is provided within the air conditioning system. And you have zoning of different areas separately to minimize or reduce uh, the infection from spreading. Uh, so that's that's again a modern building, but it's pre-COVID. Now, this is a project in Panchkula. Again, it's an office building. Um, it's post-COVID, again, for the government. So that's where, um, again, uh, besides the provision of open windows, uh, fresh air, and all the things which I talked about in the previous slide, um, again, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, technology is now coming in where you are anyway talking about uh, aspects like uh, you know, UVGI systems, ultraviolet systems, uh, which you put in the supply ducts of the HU, the return ducts, uh, so that the supply air and the returning air both are disinfected from viruses and other bacteria as well. Um, so uh, that, is a, that is a technology which has been there in the health sector for a long time, and now uh, mainstream buildings are adopting this. This is already installed in this particular project, one of the first uh, large scale. So we cannot see your screen. Hello? So are you there? Okay, while we get the uh, uh, architect Dipendra uh, Prasad back, I would request uh, architect Premendra Raj Mehta, sir, if he can join now. Oh, hold on. It's still a problem. It's still a problem. Mehta, sir, are you there? Sometimes still getting corrected. Yeah. So please share your screen. Uh, one second. Yeah. Uh, Prasad, sir. Yeah, one second. We had lost you. Okay. Um, one you can second. Conclude, sir. You can conclude in a minute, sir. Uh, yes, I will. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah. So I'll um, get back to the presentation. Uh, uh, Prasad, sir, I, I think, think there uh, has been some confusion. So, I if we can let Mehta, sir, present. So, I'll um, we'll come okay. back to you. We'll come back to you, sir. So, I'll I'll basically I think uh, uh, you know end on one particular point, please, which please. is that yeah. So, I think uh, uh, without the slide, I think the broad point can be still said, and that is that I think there are no lack of codal guidelines which are there. I think uh, there are many. But uh, I think they need to be followed. Secondly, how do we ensure quality in uh, uh, this particular production? So um, there are, I think, uh, three broad guidelines which are there. One is National Building Code and individual codes like SP41. They're recommendatory and uh, they're probably not uh, forcing people to do this. Building bylaws are there. They are providing minimum provisions, but many results are not encouraging. Now we are putting our trust in certain green building rating systems like the wellness system, Griha, IGBC, where we are expecting that the pull of the market and you know a premium on adequate provisions comes into the play. The market will ask for it. So I, I believe that an important missing link is basically 
again educating the public to demand this as a right and i think uh, this is in fact a point to justice goel as well where we say that this particular aspect of light and ventilation is not just a market commodity uh, it's a, um, it's a right which the public must have if if a, if a builder has not given this then one should be able to approach the courts and you know get relief and there has to be secondly a continuous sensitization of the professionals and their very important interaction with medical professionals researchers so that we are not designing in isolation and we are working together with the relevant professionals to get the best outputs thank you so much thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much sir it was very enlightening and uh, you know if there are some questions i will make a note and we'll ask at the end of the seminar sir okay raja uh, mehta sir uh, please screen? can you join okay, us can sir, you please see my screen? Screen? share your screen sir can you see my screen now can you see my screen now we can see the screen but no content no content okay content of answer right okay Raja, yes, can you can see now, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, okay, okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. So uh, let me take uh, all of you uh, 25 years back, 50th year of India's independence, when the parliament resolved that every citizen shall have shelter and drinking water. And this is exactly what uh, Honorable Justice Goel made a mention that shelter habitation and water they go together so this is what it was resolved then i take you another 25 years back sometime in uh, late 60s early 70s during the passage of uh, architects bill while it was under consideration of the house uh, the in during the debate it was said that the role of architecture while discussing the importance of the subject of architecture and profession of architecture it was said that it would fulfill the requirement of functions the spaces will be functional if there is an architect it also said that it will ensure comfort and practice of profession will also ensure safety so these were the three key points which were uh, talked about in favor of the passage of the bill and it became an act in 1972 now let us look at what are these safety issues in architecture in built environment in urban development you see one is life safety which is dealt with by structural engineering electrical engineering and fire safety you see they, these are related to life safety but the other important thing is health safety which is determined by the quantum of light quantum of ventilation the availability of water supply drainage and more most importantly the sewerage system so the inflow of water and then outflow of discharge they are paramount uh, to the health safety requirement of a um, habitat then let's look at what is health safety net for public you see if that is the objective how do we deal with it so one is architecture and town planning education you prepare professionals you prepare a professional support system for the society in which uh, the thought process uh, goes into how to ensure that the health would be uh, health safety will be there while we construct uh, buildings or we create architecture the second part of the safety net is development control norms and building bylaws you see these, this is the part of a regulatory mechanism uh, to ensure that what is required as bare minimum in terms of light ventilation water supply sewerage drainage would be provided for and the third part of the safety net is that there will be municipal services particularly when we are talking of urban areas and infrastructure which will proactively facilitate what is provided in the regulatory regime and what professionals think is a requirement uh for minimum light ventilation water and drainage so this is the safety net which the lawmakers thought 
to be available to us. But what has gone wrong? We have an urban population in India, which is 30%, likely to become 40 very soon, another decade. And thereafter, I do not know what would be the progression, but uh, there are studies which indicate that it may go up to 50%. But look at the situation now. Out of 30%, 50% of the urban development is unplanned unauthorized, as they say, but people live there. So 50% of the population lives in unplanned area and half of it is actually slums. So net to net, 15% of India is already deprived of the safety net. There are no professionals. There is no legal, regulatory regime. There is no mechanism where municipal facilities could be made available to them in the required quantity or let us look at what is happening to the remaining half of the population, which is in the planned area. So here, the peculiarity is that every 20th year, when we have a master plan, you increase density, you increase FAR, you increase ground coverage. So ultimately, the word planned and unplanned have become synonymous. You see, you plan for X density, you develop the infrastructure for X density, Suddenly, you double the density, you double the FAR to achieve that double the density, you increase ground coverage, and finally, the municipal system stops working. It is overstretched, as some people may say, but actually not even fit to deal with that. Just to take some instances of Delhi for the remaining half, ground coverage in plots up to 100 square meters has become 100%. Where do you get light and ventilation from? You see, three sites you are blocked. You are back to back with your neighbor, and there is no possibility of any natural light to come in from the longer size of the building and one shorter side. So what you have is one aperture on the face and the entire building, the depth. Supposing if I'm talking of 100 square meters of plot, it is uh, whatever 30 feet by 60 feet or something. Um, the rooms are one behind the other, and we expect that this would happen. So this is not there. If you are, you have doubled, and now drainage and sewers overflow. So the process of uh, entire making new master plan, new bylaws after every 20 years is that what you do is you increase FAR, you have concepts of purchasable FAR, you have transfer of development rights from one place to another, without guaranteeing that there would be minimum sun or minimum water or minimum fresh air, which will be ensured and provided to every person. So net to net, what you have done, you have vitiated the entire natural ecosystem. You see, this is what we have done ourselves. So the implication is of this over density, under provisions of sewer, under provision of drainage, no possibility of light entering, no possibilities of air entering into your building. We have indoor air quality, which is substandard and stale. Outdoor air quality has become pathetic and acidic. You see, you go into certain areas in Delhi, the metal corrodes by itself. You put your car outside, it is gone after a few years. Your refrigerator, though it is inside, uh, it is eaten away. The, the, the metal does not stay, you see, it goes. So that's the kind of situation we have created for ourselves. But people thought they need to protect themselves. So the first thing they did is that let not any air come from outside. The acidic air or the poor quality of air, let it not enter. So windows are closed. Then they think that if I install a cooler or air conditioner, something good will happen. Air coolers will maybe filter the air, Air conditioners will help me have better air quality inside and some more gadgets of purifiers and other things. So people have started installing it. These gadgets have also started solving the problem which is available, maybe imagined, maybe not properly understood, but none actually attempts to solve the root cause of these problems. So we have air coolers, air conditioners, air purifier, and so on. And what they ultimately end up doing is they bring in poor outside air quality, air inside, thinking that it is better. And the other exercise which is done is we keep on recycling the poor indoor air, what we have, 
be it with air conditioners, be it with fan, whatever gadget we have, we keep on recirculating it. So that is what we inhale. And the net output is actually a disaster. We spread and increase all respiratory diseases. We overburden the healthcare system and the will of the people expressed through the parliamentary laws is squarely defeated only by those who were entrusted to implement it. So that is where we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, architect Premendra Med uh, Raj Mehta, sir. Sir has multiple years of experience and he has shared his experience. We are very grateful. If there are any questions, please put it in the chat box. We will ask sir at the end of this online webinar. Now I have to rush to the next speaker. You know, our next speaker is Advocate J.C. Mittal. Sir is ex-chairman Bar Council of Delhi. He is also the president of the Delhi High Court Bar Association. And he's been practicing since 1972. This is his 50th, 50th year of practice. I want to thank sir because it is only sir's push that we work in this area and this webinar is today possible only because of the push that was given to us by uh, Casey Mittal, sir. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. I request you to please share your views with our participants. Unmute, Kati. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. Professor Rao, Director SPA, Mr. Mehta, Mr. Prasad and other dignitaries, in fact, if I uh, begin with saying that how the whole chain started, as a resident of Delhi, since 1963, where I have seen, as far as the pollution and the problem are concerned, Lately, I was uh, more concerned and worried about the central, centrally air-conditioned buildings where the High Court Chief Justice took a Suomoto notice as far as their own High Court building is concerned. And when certain orders were passed, that didn't perhaps help much when I noticed it and having realized we discussed amongst ourselves the impact of COVID-19 and the how the aerosol can spread the COVID in a centrally air-conditioned building, then I moved an application before the High Court in the same petition where the court gave a direction, they administratively examined the whole issue where I think CPWD and some judges and a lot of them were involved. And finally, what happened was the outcome today is that the high court building has a ventilation. This is this how is they, it, it took a change. It, it was it's really today if somebody comes and sees the high court building and it is not uh, the air condition is not as it used to be earlier and now they have provided a ventilation and everything i think it took few months the issue uh, ultimately perhaps raja singh and uh, and uh, divan sahab those who have also ultimately realized and since they have been working on this subject. The issue came up very promptly because we also realized after myself having uh, realized after having discussed with both of them that what is happening? We are having centrally air conditioned buildings with no outside ventilation. We are having railways. We are having DTC buses where there is no ventilation causing a spread of COVID. Therefore, it's something which is very, 
which was a very serious thing, which is happening even now. And then we took up this and filed a PIL. Raja Singh was uh, filed a PIL in the High Court. And I'm glad to uh, share with all of you that the Division Bench of Delhi High Court gave a very good direction to all the governmental agencies to frame bylaws and come out with this solution because this is something which is affecting health of everybody whosoever is in the building or whosoever widgets. I don't know, so far perhaps we were trying, we have been moving around, we met the minister also and gave him the court order and certain uh, uh, details about it when Mr. Divan and Mr. Raja Singh and other uh, uh, friends were also there. Why I'm mentioning all this is that uh, in addition to this, I'm just uh, uh, clubbing another issue where as a resident of Delhi, what is my another concern? I've been noticing as Mr. Mehta also pointed out and Mr. Prasad also referred to all that and perhaps Mr. Yogili also uh, referred about it. What is happening in Delhi? I don't know what are the planners and what is this master plan business is going on and how it is being done. Do they really bother about public health? Public health, health is a fundamental right. Look at the kind of buildings that have come up after MPD 2021, the whole Delhi, everybody is facing the vitamin D problem. There is no air circulation. There is no sunlight circulation, which are the, the fundamental requirements of a human being. But what are we doing? The builder will come out with a building. He will encroach upon. He'll go beyond his boundaries, leave no place. <coughs> no space for air circulation or for sunlight and people having money they go and buy and start living and then they make it fully air conditioned blocking completely the ventilation and air from outside what are we doing what kind of the uh, the development is this and believe me and all of you know I think 99% people living in such buildings, they are, they are facing these kind of problems apart from the uh, airborne diseases. And now they are coming out with the 2041. Mr. Mehta rightly pointed out that you increase FAR every time and density, density of population. What are we doing? What is happening? Will anybody check it? We are practically being trapped, being trapped. Why? Because somebody, I don't know whether what plays a role, but these MPD, whether it is 2021 or whether it is 2041, this has, has completely ignored the public health. The question therefore is, we have been debating and talking about it. Number one, whether, and I requested Sidiwan also, and I request all of you, and particularly uh, Dr. Rav, you are the core authority. You have the core power. You are the main authority to teach the fundamentals to your architects. But what happens when the municipality or the MPD, they plan, they come out with, uh, with um, uh, master plan, they do something different. Why can't we make sure that the air and sunlight circulation is ensured in every building and every floor? Mr. So Mehta rightly pointed out left, right and back. You see, it's totally covered. You hardly get any, any uh, sun or light. Those are the basic problems where, apart from the central air-conditioned buildings, the, this, these problems are increasing day by day. 
and nobody seems to be addressing on all these problems which is affecting every every resident of delhi i thought perhaps when we came out for this uh, centrally air conditioned uh, building issue we wanted to come out with programs where like mass awakening so that people can just understand and realize how important is the ventilation how do we uh, uh, dilution of vent uh, ventilation how best we can educate how can we enforce how how much and in how, what manner we can compel the authorities that before you make any uh, master plan or before you enforce uh, or or the building bylaws please make sure that this is not only made mandatory but this is also enforced and anybody violating should face the consequences unfortunately what is happening in the country and what is uh, we know all of them how the building bylaws are flouted what happens and how it happens there is hardly any enforcement of building by laws let me just tell you an example even now i have been noticing all these uh, prime colony colonies in delhi the recent buildings how it has come up the builder will encroach he will go even out of his boundary cover 100% left right center and goes uh, multi storied although there is a uh, there was a challenge in the supreme court but what happened the ch challenge also failed because that that petition has now been uh, uh, is no more pending in the supreme court it has gone to the tribunals the uh, the municipal tribunals where nothing is going to happen as far as the third floor part is concerned which is of course under a undertaking given to the municipal corporation but the question and i will request the spa and mr divan and uh, mr raja singh let us involve more and more people on this because we have to save the life we have to save the health of the people it is our primary responsibility even if the authorities do not follow it if they don't do it we all have to join together and spa being the prime institution having this as its fundamental educate and enforce i don't know why when the master plan is uh, 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 is being uh, finalized spa role in it spa spa's approval or the consent how can the government proceed on those lines because you are the you are the authority where you can definitely tell and tell the government that don't do this or do this because otherwise this is where the public health is going to be affected so my request to all of you are joined together to to save the life or the health of the people we are let me tell you very frank every day delhi is a burning pyre it's a burning uh, what is that uh, chamber of, uh, uh, and lot of things are being said about it and we are living in such an environment everybody's health and children's is it people and everybody is getting and most of the people have, have airborne problems respiratory problems therefore it's high time when we should all join together and come out see to it that the our health is protected and we we are safe and secure at least we get a fresh air we get a pure air a quality air to breathe i i hope and i request every all of let us plan and work out with that I, uh, dr rao and raja sir raja singh for having give, given me this opportunity and to organize this webinar on this burning and issue this more public health thank you very much thank you sir thank you very movingly sir i hope all the you said your issues and we have made note of everything that you have said and all our students all our fellow professionals have made a note and we will work together in this area so that this area there is some work on this and we get the realization of the right to healthy environment in our cities thank you so much uh, advocate kc mithal sir for joining us today
thank you if there's some more some questions uh, you know please put them in the chat so that we can ask uh, advocate sir at the end of the webinar now i'll take the permission to move on to our next speaker our next speaker is dr satish kaipeliawar dr satish is a output or a very uh, you know his contribution is there because he studied in tiss that is tata institute of social studies where he is a masters in health administration and he also was under the colombo plan fellowship he is also a mbbs doctor and he has worked at pat in tb and infectious diseases he was in parpiramal swasthya he was is the team lead in share india and he's done the it is now the associate program director of mischief star share india project along with cdc or the center for disease control united states he has you know a lot of uh, feathers in his cap he's introduced the hepatitis b vaccine he's done advocacy and capacity building and he's also you know done so much work with in the area of ventilation she was a medical officer in very uh, remote and small uh, public health centers and he has the experience from the grassroots and we are very happy and grateful and honored that he is here to share his experiences on the topic called how small changes in the built environment can solve mighty public health problems over to you dr satish kapilewa yeah uh, first of all thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this excellent platform i myself have learned a lot of things here uh, uh, all respected dignitaries honorable justice uh, goel ji uh, kc mithal ji mehta ji dipendra prasad ji and professor lee and uh, thanks for inviting me on this wonderful platform professor divan and uh, 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 architect raja uh, really grateful to you uh, we have all come together i think it's a beginning together we can take this forward and we we have known about the law position what needs to be done and now i will be talking in on how things have to be done if there is an intention how things needs to be done so my my experience goes way back uh, uh, when I, i remember biomedical waste management and handling rules of 1998 and from that time i started on infection uh, prevention and control uh, right from injection safety safe management of injection waste needle stick injuries uh hepatitis b hepatitis c prevention and all so from there it started and now it has come to the infection prevention and control so uh 2008 to 2021 i'm going to talk about a journey from there uh, i have no commercial conflict of interest but i do have conflict of interest in saving human lives promoting quality of life and creating happy faces in the community i strongly believe that we all should really work towards this and i would like to acknowledge up front the usaid arth national tb program municipal corporation of greater mumbai national tb elimination program and centers for disease control and prevention and my parent organization share india for whom i am indebted to over crowding we have we have we have seen it everywhere and these are some of the glimpses of the pictures from different hospital settings from different parts of the country and overcrowding is really really a problem and respiratory diseases occur in high transmission settings this is these are the pictures from a typical morning uh, uh, in any hospital you go and visit you will find this this sort of things so i i need not go into the details about uh, about the droplets and droplet nuclei but they are the vehicles for transmission and transmission is very unpredictable and it is the indoor business as professor lee has said it is the indoor business that we need to really correct ourselves with and so are we are we really safe going into uh, into such environments we will have to really think about that so uh, some interventions can really uh, prevent or reduce the transmissibility and one such is now we are we are promoting mask we are promoting uh, coverage of cough so respiratory diseases occur in high vulnerable or transmission settings and high vulnerable and transmission settings are hospitals tb and hiv clinics the health posts the dispensaries the health centers maternity homes clinics private government and also now we should really think about schools cinema halls malls supermarkets prisons slum refugee camps etc and what is our role 
and how do we address all this? So pilots were conducted in 2008 to 2010 in West Bengal, Gujarat, and Andhra Pradesh, uh, and that led to the uh, building national guidelines for infection control in 2010. And Three main components are spoken about in this guideline, national guideline. This is available on the website. So they talk about administrative and managerial controls, environmental controls, and personal protective equipment. So uh, my outline of my presentation uh, would be like this. How do we really do all this? Now, if there is an intention, now intention is really getting built up. We have, we have, we have forced the intention to really get built up, and we all feel that this is a necessity, and it is our our personal right to really be safe in this environment. So now, when we have made that decision, how do we really implement this? So we have an experience of around 15 to 20 years now, and putting all that together, I have put this across into a few slides. So how do we establish a unit? There has to be a, uh, a unit which collectively looks after all this activity. Not, not any one individual will be able to really do. Now you can see here, there are architects, there are lawyers, there are judges, there are public health professionals. Uh, there are different uh, uh, people who are working together to actually take this happen. So we have put in and together a model also. And then after doing all this, everyone should be really trained, trained properly to really take this forward. Then what would be the implementation steps? What would be the results of all this? What challenges do we face? What lessons we, we learned in this? And how do we really overcome those lessons? And then how do we measure our successes in terms of monitoring? And then, then also I'll talk about a little bit about scale up. So a dedicated infection control unit is, is really the need of the hour. And as I said, uh, the required support and intention has to be there to really drive this. The required support and intention is really coming up now. And I'm, I'm very happy that this platform has really uh, made us aware that there is an intention, there is a uh, uh, leadership which is really emerging, uh, which really wants to address this issue. So what is the combined skill set required for all this? So as I said, it is not one individual's activity, but it's a combined skill set that has to come really uh, together to take this forward. So experience of knowledge of healthcare facilities to perform facility risk assessments, then clinical experience of respiratory diseases and knowledge of national programs, understanding of bacteriology and infectious diseases, understanding of building structures and how and when they can be changed, how they can be modified, that needs to be really uh, looked into. Experience with monitoring program performance also, because we need to also see how we are performing. Are we really reaching the milestones? Are there any mid-course corrections? We need to really look into all this. So this is a combined skill set, which I would, I would say would really go into an infection control unit, which should be which should be really built and work together on this. So we have put an attempt to um, build a unit around this, and we thought that the nurse, the public health nurse, who is at the institution level, is the implementer of all this. So that is a very important position within the team. The microbiologist who really understands uh, um, the, the real things, the integrities of the system there. Experienced TB physician, architect, and engineer. We make sure that there is always one architect or engineer in our team so that he really helps us take these things forward. Then a monitoring and evaluation expert and a project manager to manage all this. So we had a very careful interview process and we selected very passionate individuals to, to really join us in this mission. And so highly focused, intense, hands-on training was provided. It, it consisted of didactics and practical sessions, hands-on experience, and we even trained people, uh, taking them to the field and how to do these assessments. We have really done to that extent. And some of the equipments which we use here, I did not really uh, uh, explain this to you people. I use raniometer, laser tape, smoke tubes, very simple. And if, if the smoke tubes are not available, even we have used agarbatti and demonstration of a, a burning of a tissue to actually see the, uh, the wind flow. So what process we have really taken? What we have done is we have, uh, we have implemented this in four to five states now, like in, like in West Bengal, as I said, in Andhra Pradesh, in, uh, in Gujarat, and in Maharashtra also. In, in Mumbai also, we have, we have implemented this project all across. So what we did first, first step was to enlist all the institution, estimate what time is required for this assessment, develop a micro plan, then do a baseline assessment. And when, once a baseline assessment is done, we provide recommendations and those recommendations are reviewed every four months so that whatever is suggested there is getting implemented and the compliance is adhered to. 
such such follow ups we do every four months so that whatever good practices we have we have put in there are sustainable for a longer term and these are some of the standard operating procedures which we have really developed and this is out of an experience of almost 10 years that you are you are seeing these three bullets here and the sub bullets uh, uh, within this so these are very very essential we need to really first sensitize the whole of the ward or the whole of the town uh, all the health officials there as to what this exercise is about and this is not a this is not an inspection this is not a uh, a, a watch on them but but it is helping them to really making them uh, their premises infection control compliant so that sensitization need to really first go then follow up with we will have to do an assessment as to where do this where does this institution stand we have a set of indicators uh, 40 odd indicators we we apply to the institutions and then we study very closely uh, the patient flow we study the health facility its functions its floor plan air flows air exchange how many people really come in there and then if there are problems we also understand and discuss those problems with the with the healthcare providers there because we might be giving solutions which are not implementable there so we will have to really uh, talk to them understand their problems and then come up with a debriefing meeting to say that this is the assessment this is the report and this is what uh, we together needs to need, need to do and we have seen to it that always the healthcare professionals of that institutions also take part in our assessment so that there is always an ownership which is built up within the institution and then the post assessment we further follow it up by sending the emails to the concerned officials we we provide all the reports in a file folder and we hand it over to the institutions so that they are preserved there for our next visit when we come to the next visit at that time we, we pull out those folders and then see where did we stand last time and did we really progress after that or are we at least sustaining what we have um, informed so this this is the way we how uh, do this and now my team has actually standardized all these processes and i could i, I can probably say that we take around 320 minutes per assessment so it is less than 6 hours of time uh, we can produce an assessment report so these are some of the steps and this is some some of the standard time which my team takes and so uh, i would like to also mention here that when we did our first assessment we took around 7 days to produce a report and over the period of 6 months we standardized ourselves and we really brought it down to daily one institution we can assess and provide the report so this is the kind of uh, finesse this is the kind of speed which my my uh, team has really developed over time so manage crowding to prevent disease transmission it, this is very very important a small word crowding crowding internal crowding is really really a problem so understand the process of patient flow how many people are really having footfalls within that institution we need to study the floor plans we have to recognize problems and of overcrowding we need to brainstorm solutions along with them so understand implementers perspective and then develop a general consensus and then discuss a way forward so i am going to actually uh, present with you some of the from all the actual floor plans and other things where uh, you you will be able to really understand what what this is so here we can see an institution which has got around 150 to 200 uh, 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 footfalls in this institution and the institution typically consists of uh, the registration room the medical officers room the, the the laboratory the pharmacy and all so we have to really look into the process flow here we have to see how uh, the the crowd enters into an institution how they go to the registration and after the registration is over how does uh, that person goes into the registration room and the and the, and the waiting area where they where they where they go on crowding there so a lot of crowd is seen in the waiting areas we need to then see how the person goes to the medical officer's room typically this is the flow and from the medical officer's room either he will go to the uh, pharmacy or he will go to the laboratory for investigations so uh, looking at all this we need to understand where the overcrowding is really happening and how can we prevent that overcrowding that this is the simplest diagram which we could we could we could reproduce uh, as as you can see this is the entry to the institution premises and are given a legend here where general opd is colored with blue tb patients are colored with red and coughing patients are colored with violet and immunization babies who are who are little babies who come for immunization uh, these are some of the tracks so all these tracks they enter here and they they actually wait in this waiting room so there is a lot of crowding of healthy patients healthy little babies healthy patients and also 
the coughing patients there. So a lot of transmission, as Dr. Lee has mentioned, happens in this waiting area. So we need to really urgently decongest this waiting areas. So how did we, how did we do that? We we actually uh, uh, provided different pathways and we provided these different uh, uh, areas for entry. Now here for the lab, the person can directly enter from outside to the lab. We open the window here and he can deposit the sputum sample there. Similarly, the immunization babies can straight away go to the institution without any mixing there. And so the, the registration counter also was open from outside. So people actually go from outside. There is no waiting here. So people crowd is completely well managed here within this. So this is how we, we actually did in the institutions. And some of the pictures I'm going to share with you here before after pictures. This is some one of the urban health centers and here there was a playground here and there was a lot of overcrowding within the institution. Uh, so we created a small shed here and a waiting area and pulled out all the crowds here for, for waiting. And then there was a there was a, uh, a grill which was to be opened, a simple intervention, but that really prevented the overcrowding there. So similarly, this is a pediatric drug resistant TB OPD. And here we can see uh, all the rooms were closed because they wanted AC and uh, they wanted a cool environment uh, in environment there. So we then asked them to remove all this and open up all the ventilation there so that there is a free flow of air within the institution there. And similarly, these are the pictures of the closed doors and the open doors. So this also will 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 provide them free. Uh, so simple interventions to do. Same thing here again. So there are certain immediate interventions. The moment we do our assessments, they immediately modify. They modify the timings, they modify the access. Now, some of the patients can be actually called in the morning. Some of the patients can be called in the afternoon. So we can really uh, decongest the crowds. So fast track symptomatic can be done. So if a person is coughing there, he can, he can jump the queue and he can actually directly go to the medical officer and see. So there are certain long-term interventions also where involvement of some construction work or some refurbishments is, is done for which some budget allocations need to be then, uh, then, then done for that. So how did we persuade people to actually get these things done? So the assessment visit reports to the facility director so that the facility director has got all this information at his hand. He can review it in these monthly meetings. And we also did some periodic follow-up phone calls to the facility uh, director to understand uh, what compliance is, is really achieved by that time. And then we convinced all the decision makers for actionable items. And also, we had a sensitization meeting of all the architects and engineers uh, of, the, of the Greater Municipal Corporation, where, where we have uh, you know, taken them through all the infection control measures which the institutions have taken up. And then they, if there are any refurbishments that are required, we have brought in that, our architect has brought in that as a plan to them and they, they executed it. So progress, as I said, we, we also have monitored our progress and on our subsequent baseline, first follow-up and second follow-up, we have really made some progress and the progress is still on. The graph is still going up now. So this is just a glimpse of first and second follow. -up. We have done such five follow-ups. So what are, what are the lessons we learned here? Once sensitized, the facility staff want to adhere to AIC, but the challenges still exist there. Administrative and managerial recommendations are very quickly followed. It's a low-hanging fruit, so, so you, you see the bars really going up there. And recommendation that requires construction and budget allocations and processes are a little time consuming. So they take a little more time, but uh, with, with the right approach, we are able to really track that also. And need for a periodic review at highest level in order to influence continuing compliance. This is very, very important that we have to bring it, bring up this at the highest level of the institution uh, where, where we actually uh, uh, give them the reports and the institution director or the highest authority really reviews this on a periodic basis. Only then these activities really uh, go forward. So resource allocation for dedicated team uh, uh, is, is, is a must. And so for any activity, we need to have resources in place and all the manpower in place to really take this forward. Insufficient budget and cumbersome processes for refurbishments was a, uh, was a, was a, was a time consuming process for us. And staff turnover also, nursing staff, architecture staff, we, uh, we had a lot of turnover of this staff because um, they were still not able to find the, the importance it attracted, or it was really not very, very lucrative for them to really continue on. So I would request from this platform, Professor Devan, I have, I have already requested that we need to really generate that interest amongst these young professionals to really take on these challenges. 
and the liquidityness or the the monetary things would really come and fall in place because it is a huge need of the hour and we need professionals to really work around and india is such a vast country so there is a lot of work for for many of the people there so we have to sensitize and motivate specialization in public health and uh, architects and nurses highlight role of infection control in every faculty motivate health facility staff on com uh, compliance and another aspect is healthcare worker surveillance this is a difficult area to implement within the health institutions we need to have a surveillance of healthcare workers where we on a periodic basis we we check their health status uh, as to if you are putting everything in place uh, i'm sure the healthcare surveillance would also improve uh, because we see many of the healthcare people also getting infected today so we can prevent all that uh, if we do the uh, surveillance so now i'll be talking about monitoring dashboards and grading institutions so what we have done is uh, you you can see this dashboards where we have a set of indicators and we have a set of facilities and you you see some red color here some green color here some blue color here so all the red color indicates that things are not implemented and all the green colors indicate that things are implemented there is compliance and blue color is either it is not uh, not applicable or it is in progress so we have done this for baseline this is our baseline assessment uh, you can see a lot of red colors here and then in the first assessment itself it has changed to a lot of green so the compliance can be actually looked into so uh, this kind of dashboards are really loved by uh, the the decision makers the people who are at the helm of affairs at the head of the institutions they actually like love to see these dashboards and it is very easy for them to make out whether my institutions are really doing well or not you see now this is the third second assessment and so as we reach to the fifth assessments the red color slowly gets disappeared so that means to say that we are complying and we are doing that added to that we also have done a grading system which we introduced uh, where all the four quadrants you can see right lower quadrant it is 0 to 25% 25 26 to 50% and then 51 to 75 and so what we did every indicator we have given a mark and we have graded this institutions so at the baseline at the baseline we had a lot of institution which fell into 0 to 25 categories a very few into 26 to 50 category and one or two here and none in the green category so as we moved forward we we you can see that these categories are then moving as per the arrow here the first follow up you you started getting some greens there so similarly all this are now moving towards green so what i'm trying to say is uh, this also gives uh, healthcare institutions a motivation to see that in which quarter they are they are falling into so it it self motivates them to perform better comply better and take this activities forward so this is one of the uh, drug resistant tb center in a large hospital where we have just done this in, uh, uh, intervention so optimum ventilation you can see a lot of light coming in lot of ventilation in the wards and lot of airborne infection control measures implemented so this has actually reduced the incidence uh, uh, in the last two years tb deaths have reduced and absenteeism due to tb also has reduced so we are already seeing results and the before we started the work there were a lot of these issues which even new people also have witnessed in the, in the newspapers that so many deaths and so many healthcare workers really getting affected now the situation is really getting under control so as i said all these good activities also need to be highlighted at a higher level at the national we had a national stakeholders meeting we released documents guide on airborne infection control for health institute infrastructure planners and implementers it, this was the highest body uh, at the central level where we disseminated our findings and around 10 to 15 states have really come forward to take this activity forward so i finally acknowledge again the municipal corporation of greater mumbai an uh, ntep program usid path center for disease control and share india uh, and this is my 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 team which works from mumbai currently my team which works from mumbai who are the movers and shakers i, I would say all the good work which they have done all the all the things which you have seen now is the contribution of my team and i am thankful to the team and uh, for all of you for a patient listening i would take the questions uh, uh, as per uh, thank you uh, if there are any questions please put them in the chat so sir we will take the questions at the end and uh, so it was so great that you shared your experiences from so many years and you know today you are leading the effort people don't know about it 
but we are leading the effort to make sure all our uh, healthcare small level health centers become uh, you know they, the, the spread of airborne infection is reduced in those healthcare centers especially in the tb which you know still has a high load in our community i would like to now request our next speaker our next speaker is ms ritima call who is the lead uh, health science and environment at hindustan times and you know all that great research that we academics do it's only because of uh, people like ritima ma'am that we can actually get to hear that and we can we are so well versed with what's happening only because of health writers like ma'am she's uh, also the in the hindustan times health bureau and she's formerly worked at mail today and she's an alumni of jnu we welcome you ma'am it's all yours ma'am Mute. So thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank you uh, for inviting me over for this webinar, Professor Zivan. Thank you so much. And what intrigued me when you had introduced this um, uh, webinar to me, uh, the topic I was told about this webinar was the topic that built environment and public health. So uh, this was something that immediately struck a chord with me because uh, I have been covering uh, health now. i am with been with Hindustan Times for almost two decades now. I have been covering health, uh, public health actually. So and I must say the, the, the organizers couldn't have chosen the more topical issue. Why I say so? Because we are in the middle of a devastating pandemic if you realize. And uh, how we live and how we behave, that has had a direct bearing on how this pandemic has shaped up. So, you know, it could have been controlled long back probably, but the way we are living, I mean, especially urban areas, the way they are planned, I mean, that has had a direct impact on the spread of the virus. So, uh, it's mostly the urban areas that we have seen, you know, which have been affecting it where it has spread the fastest, I would say. And key reasons, as I said, I've been speaking to a lot of health experts and they said one of the reasons why urban areas are more affected is because of the close proximity, the infrastructure, the way, the way we have planned our cities. That has been one of the areas which has been of concern. And obviously, these are the things that cannot be changed overnight. So if you if there are 20 people living in a particular in a flat, for example, you can't change that. I mean, if there are two flats running into each other, you cannot change that. That doesn't happen. He's is in a very, very bad shape. So these are the things which is why I thought that, you know, how this whole concept of buildings and public health, we don't give too much thought on a day to day basis. I and mean, it's sad, but. You know, even if when we go and buy a flat, for example, if we go recce, then we don't think about these minute things. You know, probably there could be an infectious disease sometime later in future. Are we well protected? How is the building design? How is the ventilation? Where is our light coming from? I mean, we at the most we see, you know, whether it's east facing or it's a west facing flat, for example. We don't really get into those details, which affects so much. So, and obviously, so these, these two area do two points, camp spaces and poor ventilation. So it's, and our workspaces also, unfortunately, I mean, I, it's not just the residential areas, even our workspaces are becoming very, very small, they're shrinking. And as a result, obviously, we are getting into a, a probably a situation where we are seeing an explosion of something called non-communicable diseases. Infectious disease is yes, one part of it, but then now we're looking at also non-communicable uh, diseases, heart diseases, stroke, that we are the diabetes capital of the world, mental health cases, they are rising on uh, annually actually. And we don't have spaces to walk. We don't have green patch, greenery has become almost rare. I mean, they're just patches now really, there is nothing more to that. So what what is all this bringing to us? And walking has, I mean, seriously, nobody takes the stairs. I mean, because we live in now apartment flat system has meant, you know, they have more of skyscrapers now. So 18 floors, 20 floor, 20th floor, 25th floor. Obviously, everybody will take the elevator. I mean, I have personally seen people taking elevators for like first, second or third floor, which is really, really astounding. I mean, I don't know what, what are they thinking? So physical activity has gone down drastically. 
and of course it will impact our overall health. So that is the crux of the problem I feel, but something which we don't really think about too much. And uh, what, I mean, when you think about these things, I go and meet doctors often, and I realize that what they say urban planning was a term. I mean, it, it, it's a very heavy term, but does, what does it mean currently? You know, how much of it do we know? How much of it are we acquainted with? I mean, the speaker before me, he talked about sen sanitization, uh, sanitization, creating awareness, generating awareness. So, but it's not something that one person can do. It has to be done at a multi level in the sense that a lot of stakeholders need to be party to it. It can't just be one department, one ministry. It's, it's, it's different areas, different departments. It's a collab. It has to be a collaborative effort. Otherwise, nobody, a single person, a single entity is not going to make much of a difference. So we, what, where do we start? We need to start from generating awareness. So, and also it's not just the residential or workspaces. We had a wonderful presentation where we saw the hospitals, how they, they are being built now. Earlier, I mean, they, they were dingy spaces. I mean, you go to a public health hospital, even now, I mean, I have been visiting them and I've seen, though there is a lot of improvement, I must say. But even then, the way our hospitals are designed, I mean, when a patient go, walks into a hospital, they need, I, he's already troubled. I mean, that the, some person is suffering from a disease. So what do we do? What can we do to make things better for the person? I mean, at least psychologically, if not anything else, I mean, you can't cure the disease by just making the building better. Obviously, that's not possible. But how can we make the person feel comfortable, feel at ease at least? So it, it has to be a little well lit. There has to be some scope for conversation, I mean, when patients are sitting, it shouldn't look like you have walked into a death bin, some sort of a thing. So these are little things which nobody actually thinks about. And I personally feel these are the things that make a lot of difference. When you, when you are thinking a lot, when you, when you want to see the difference, real difference being made. So uh, I would say the, the spaces make a lot of difference in our overall well-being and the current government is working on it. I mean, I have seen you, they, their focus is on holistic health. And when they say holistic health, it's not just the cure they are looking at. Obviously, you disease, you need cure, that will be taken care of. But they're also looking at cre to creating spaces. So we have these health and wellness centers coming up. There is a target of creating at least a lakh by next year. So what, what do these centers do? So they will actually have these experts. So there will be a yoga expert, for example. There will be somebody who will be taking care of your nutrition. There will be an expert who will be talking about, you know, how how to make your life better, how to live better. So uh, so these are the things that are at the grassroots level. That is what is going to change our health overall scenario completely when we say holistic health, because it's not just the disease. I mean, okay, I am sick, I'll get treatment, but in the long run, what do we want? We want preventive measures. We want things that can impact health, make things our life better. So, I mean, buildings or, or health beyond healthcare, when you say, so it's, it's the preventive part that we actually need to focus on. And a lot of people I have met, they, they, it's not that people don't want to work in these spaces, in these areas good ideas, I must say. There are a lot of people who want to really work. We have seen in this uh, conference also, we have seen how brilliant ideas are floating everywhere. But it needs to be communicated well. And that is where probably where we come into the picture. Actually, you said there's a lot of academic work that goes, but why, how to make it actually accessible to each and every person? The little young people, especially the children. I mean, the most worst affected ones are the children right now, if you see. I mean, their outdoor activities have become bare minimum. They're cooped up most, most of the time. Pandemic has not helped at all. I mean, it has become worse, I know. So how do we contribute? How do we, I mean, there's a lot of, lot of brainstorming that need, that's need, needs to be done on these subjects. I mean, how can we come together? What are the organizations, not just the architects, the healthcare professional, as the person speaker before me rightly said, it's not just the healthcare professionals or not just the architects, or not just probably a government division, new urban development ministry. All of us have, uh, it's absolutely imperative that all of us come together and brainstorm 
and you make use of the media, obviously that needs that's there. I mean, how would effective messaging is it's equally important. It's just not there's a lot of good work that's happening, but the effective messaging, communicating with people on ground, the masses, they should know what they should do and what they should not do. As I said, generating awareness is very important. What we are doing right and what we, we are not doing right. So uh, these little things, I would say, make will go a long way in probably changing our overall health, our well-being, in making a positive difference in our lives. That is something which I strongly believe is what is going to work. Uh, this is more or less what I had to say on this, but if there are any questions, I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, you have put a lot of light, you know, and uh, very vivid sharing of your experience. And, you know, uh, we hope that whatever work we do, we will, we'll, we'll, you'll listen to that and make sure all the public gets to know about it because we've had great sure. speakers, including the previous speaker, including Jugo Lee, you know, all of them spoke about the engineering the healthcare part the architecture part and you know uh, exactly what you have said has been very crucial because you you spoke about health beyond healthcare and the role of buildings and public health and we really really thank you so much for you know taking time out and joining us and sharing your uh, knowledge with us thank you so much ma'am no problem no welcome uh, i want to next request uh miss mohana basu who's a special correspondent when who writes for science at the print and the title of her address is going to be science journalist and the role they play in disseminating crucial information lessons from COVID-19. Uh, Mohana ma'am, all it's now uh, stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. Raja, thank you for inviting me to this webinar and uh, you know I don't really have a presentation but really not used to being on this side of things during a webinar. But I do have a lot of lot of things to say about uh, you know the role of science journalists. So I'm going to try and keep this uh, short and sweet. Um, so you know to begin with, uh, when we talk about this pandemic, it's it's something that I like to start from when it began. Uh, I remember it was sometime during uh, December 2019 that I had mentioned in a YouTube show called uh, Scientifics, uh, which is a weekly roundup of science stories that we do at the print, that there is a mystery SARS-like virus doing the rounds in China. And uh, little did I know at that time that this mystery virus would dominate the news for the next two years and also completely change the way that science news is written and consumed. Uh, I have been writing about science for uh, nearly five years now, and honestly, my focus in general has been about highlighting, uh, you know, the lesser known scientific works from Indian labs. Uh, and like any other journalist, my work relies a lot on people I meet and know, and scientists who are investing time in engaging with the media willingly, right? So I'm a graduate in physics, but I have to write about a about all the science. So I think I managed fairly well, and that's because science news was never as fast paced as other types of news, which meant I could take my time to learn a new topic and spend time asking a lot of questions to scientists, right? So anytime I had a doubt, I would just call up and, you know, just, just uh, be a student there. So, but the COVID pandemic completely changed things uh, in the sense that you know, now we were dealing with this invisible virus and people knew nothing about it. So there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered. They needed to be answered immediately, but not enough scientists were willing to engage with the media to answer them. I mean, a lot of those who were speaking were uh, basically, you know, not virologists or not epidemiologists, because let's face it, we, we don't really really give, the, give these people the same start status that we give to cardiologists, for example. So uh, it was in this environment of you know, lack of information and a lot of fear that uh, we journalists set out to answer questions and spread the information that the public needed. So uh, during the initial stages of the pandemic, in fact, uh, I think it was just say two or three days into the first lockdown that happened, uh, that I heard that people had stopped their newspaper subscriptions due to the fear of the virus. 
again at that time a uh, very little was known about the virus and more most of what we knew extrapolation from data from the 2022 uh, the 20, 2002 SARS outbreak and the MERS outbreak so in any case whatever the experts told me that uh, that is what I had written so experts told me that it was possible for the virus to spread through newspapers but it was very unlikely so as in as in it was like the most unlikely scenario among all the things that we knew about that virus and how it spreads spreading by uh, the newspaper was the least likely so uh, we went ahead and published that piece and uh, then we got a legal notice from one of the biggest media houses in india and uh, that asked us to basically uh, you know take down that piece because it harmed their business and soon after a lot of media organizations began to run visuals of spraying uh, disinfectants on their papers before distribution uh, now again i'm i'm not an expert but that made no sense except to give like a false reassurance to our readers and uh, we now know that the virus is least likely to spread through surfaces but such such practice of you know obsessively disinfecting surfaces just just continues so this this episode right in the beginning of the pandemic it it taught me something very important and that often do not read beyond the headline or the first few lines in the article the information uh, especially when it you know uh, affects public health it has to be sent out in a way that the conclusion the main point becomes very clear right in the beginning itself i mean we are are in in this era of social media where people consume news on social media they want it quick and they do not go ahead and read the entire article and a lot of what they know is based on just headlines uh and it's been almost two years now since then and we are still spraying disinfectants everywhere even though we now know that that the virus is spreading more through aerosols than through surfaces and uh, not just this like throughout this pandemic there have been repeated instances of when dissemination of uh, scientific news has not really been ideal um like for example the whole hydroxychloroquine fiasco i would call it a fiasco because uh, you know it it was a low cost malaria drug it was easily available everyone wanted it to work but unfortunately it scope and the problem was that the process of scientific publication is much slower than the news news cycle so what what happened was that a small trial showed that the drug showed promise in maybe some 30 people but but an, 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 another one it killed viral cells so the headline is not able to uh you know include this nuance these nuances so based on very early trials and there were a lot of um, clinical trials that started at that time but but people in general and even journalists do not fully understand what exactly happens in the clinical trials the concept of controls of of different you know uh, setup of, of things that are included in a trial and what what those things mean in terms of you know interpreting the results and in that rush in that rush to find a, a drug quickly to, to cure people quickly even the who ended up endorsing a, a flawed study on hydroxychloroquine so so as a result what would happen was like even when drug clinical trials or scientific uh studies in general began to show that this drug does not work it did not leave the news cycle because political leaders began to talk about it india gifted it to other countries for example so somebody who does not read or write scientific news ends up thinking that it is a legitimate covid drug so when science news begins to overlap political news it it just adds to the confusion it adds to the misinformation and this 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 continued with several other things like the convalescent plasma trials the bcg vaccines and now there's like a lot of um, misinformation around ivermectin and whether or not it works on covid and all of these were continuously being hotly debated in the news when there was overwhelming evidence out to the fact that they are not actually working uh so having 
science journalists in the newsroom has has really not been the priority for media before in fact like among us among science journalists it's a running joke that if if a publication is hiring a science journalist they must be doing very well for themselves right so um, you know like we would be the first ones to be the last to be hired and the first to be fired <laughs> but uh, you know in my very short career i've realized that uh, people are actually very very interested in science news and and average indian reader is actually very smart and science is so exciting that unless you're an exceptionally bad writer people will read and understand science news but this pandemic has taught me that it's that science news is not just and should not be just uh, reduced to you know pop science articles so that this reader has something fun to learn after all the heavy political and economic news right so um, so in the public health crisis such as the one we are in right now it it becomes very important for newsrooms to be equipped with science writers who can separate facts from misinformation uh someone you know who can who can tell the difference between a scientific fact and the attempt of a pharma company or an ayurvedic company to sell their products in all this con confusion i mean like if you uh, uh, think about it i all of the uh, you know panelists have already touched on this topic that it's it's such a paradox that we live in we have a lot of information but the energies get focused in a very different way like even this morning when i came to the office i i traveled in the metro the they are still spraying disinfectants on you know your bags and your hands uh, when the metro train itself is is running on central air conditioning it's running at full capacity and there's very little information about what is being done to manage the ventilation in the metro and same is true for gyms and restaurants the public ads that invite people back to these spaces talk about the social distancing and the disinfectants but they don't talk about the ventilation so that leads me to the next point which is that science news is not uh, you know limited to informing people about science it's also about uh, informing the experts about things that are being observed on ground so for example there was long covid the 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 fact that people who were recovering for, from covid were not actually fully recovering that they had symptoms that continued so because the administration was so concerned about stopping the spread of the disease many of these people who were getting out of hospitals were not getting a chance to do follow up consultations and it was the public's reports to the media that actually highlighted the issue and even when it comes to the vaccine side effects and uh, you know that some people some people have suffered in rare instances or or breakthrough infections uh, these were things that were highlighted by the media because this is not something that was getting reported directly to the scientists who were involved in it so media is very important in terms of facilitating a two way communication between the ex experts and the public um uh, I I want to conclude by pointing out that it remains a very important for you know researchers and public authorities to engage with the media so it's it's not just enough to engage with the public through social media platforms even though that is important uh, but it it it's just that uh, you know there is a lot of lot of misinformation from some sections of the media but at the same time it is the media itself that is working hard towards fighting this misinformation So uh, in fact that is why my twitter name is also not a scientist it it's it's a reminder to everyone that even though my work is gathering and disseminating science news i'm not a scientist myself and my major responsibility is to ensure that i don't become overconfident in what i write and i'm constantly educating myself uh but i also need to have a continuous dialogue with the public health experts and scientists so that the information that reaches uh, the public is is very timely and very accurate during this uh, crisis so yeah that's that's all i have to say and uh, thank you once again for inviting me i'm uh, open to any questions that you may have thank you thank you so much ma'am for your very hearty and vivid sharing and you know uh, i want to let you know that your great article that you had done along with uh, uh, sandhya ramesh on why it's more important to disinfect the air rather than the surfaces you know has helped us you know it was part of the pil that we had put 
just to you know right. inform you and you know you yes shared. yes i saw that and i'm very glad that it helped and I, in fact at that time you know there was so little uh, uh okay. science coming on this from india that oh, most of the sources there were from you know the quotes were from international sources but i'm really glad that it made uh, you know uh, its way to the right people absolutely ma'am absolutely and thank you so much you know for sharing and for coming and taking time out and uh, i'm sure uh, you will also uh, you know cover the work that indian academics do including all the <laughs> speakers who have spoken today including dr satish and dr yuguli and dipendra ji and uh, pr mehta and thank you so much for uh, taking time yeah. out and sharing your time and sharing your great experience with us my pleasure Question. thank you so uh, now i would request professor dr anil devan who's the main uh, what do you call the key behind this whole conference the key behind this whole seminar and uh, i request him you know before i request him i would like to introduce professor devan has worked in hospital design public health for the longest time he was in the world bank he is right now the hod of architecture but he's you know perpetually for the longest time taught hospital design and public health to students of architecture he's also you know developed hospital standards he's you know contributed to the bis committees on hospital standards and even his phd was on hospital health standards so i request professor dr anil devan to talk to us about this important uh, you know webinar that was held and please give the vote of thanks to all the people who attended sir up to sir thank you raja for giving me this opportunity so uh, i would like to thank uh, school of planning and architecture uh, director our dean of studies and all the faculty members and students for being here and giving us this opportunity to make this multidisciplinary intersectorial team effort possible so now we understand we know that we cannot work in silos in isolation we have to work with public health specialists we have to work with planners with uh, architects with engineers to work on natural light and ventilation these are very basic fundamental concepts which we have somehow lost so now in uh, our buildings they say artificially lit and mechanically ventilated unfortunately it doesn't work and all our speakers so i could start with professor yes and rao and justice being here so uh, uh, it's very very important that we get uh, judiciary coming to us and so if the chairman of uh, the national green tribunal justice adarsh kumar goel was here with us it uh, made a paradigm shift to the whole discourse because now everybody listens to us so i would also like to thank professor yugoli bringing in the international uh, southeast asia viewpoint how we can learn from other people's mistakes china has already made those mistakes Hong Kong is overcrowded, so how India can, you know, leapfrog and not commit those mistakes? So we are doing these uh, TDRs and these uh, land poolings and all those things are coming, and we'll have so tall buildings, so problems and com complicating and multiplying them. And uh, I'm very very grateful to Pierre Mehta sir for giving us the legislative. Uh, aspects of it how lawmakers how what the constitution of india said and how we as uh, building professionals have to take care of it dipendra prasad was is always implementing and practicing what he preaches which is very very important for us and i really thank him for all that and advocate kc mittal sir was the backbone of making this possible this time i'm so grateful to you sir and we are ready to work with you till 
whatever time you say, all our energies are with you. And Dr. Satish sir was great in the NGO sector. So we, we had uh, 360 degree uh, perspective to it when uh, how he could pursue it and uh, work as a team with engineers, architects, public health nurses, doctors, and the community together. So unless we bring the community on board, the journey is not complete. And the press, so we had Rajima call from Hindustan Times. She gave the public health and the, how her interaction with doctors and nutrition and yoga and wellness and health and all that talking and Ayushman Bharat and all those things which are coming in the pipeline. Very good. And the science writers, the last one to be hired and the first one to be fired it was a great, great insight which we got. I hope you cover it, ma'am. So, Mohan Basu, Mohana Basu, we are very grateful to you to make it here and your writings have really made all the difference. And I would thank Raja Singh for doing such good work apart he's not just doing his phd but he's bringing it to the community also how a phd is not from the library to the library but it makes a difference to the lives of people thank you all <laughs> thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir uh, I really, really thank all of you for your time today. And I thank Professor Dr. Anil Devan. I thank uh, all the uh, dignitaries who came today. Thank you so much. And all your questions will be emailed to the speakers and we'll get back as an answer. Thank you so much for coming. And it was great having you. See you next time.